Lecture 2, Getting a Framework, Creation, Fall, Redemption, and Restoration. A quick review from our previous lecture, where we focused on the definition of biblical theology and just understanding what we're even talking about. What we came to understand there was that biblical theology is the attempt to put all of the pieces together to tell the whole biblical story, the big picture view. Or to give an even fuller description of that, biblical theology is telling the story of the Bible using a big picture view to see the truth revealed and developed across the ages. Well, if we're using that kind of framework or that kind of scheme to talk about that much of the story, the big picture wide angle view, we're really going to need some kind of summary structure or what I'm gonna call a framework to even process that much information. At a starting level, one of our problems or one of our challenges is just trying to hold it all together because there's so much content there. And I'm gonna give you a framework for understanding the biblical story to use the language of story or to think of this as a drama, a play. Then let's think of four specific scenes, or you might even say if it was a drama, acts. Four major sections of the story and each one of those sections having its own set of characteristics. Now, in terms of time, these scenes overlap with one another, and we can recognize then that certain periods of time incorporate at least two, sometimes even possibly, arguably three, different aspects of these scenes. Still, the framework gives us a good starting point for how to think about the biblical story. And I'll introduce first the scenes. I'll explain what each one of those scenes are, what it means. I'll give a core concept for each, and that's really what you need to hold on to. You need to grab the core concept for each one of these four scenes. And then I'll finally illustrate this by talking about two specific topical applications. We'll talk about the problem of evil and a theology of family. Running those topics through this grid or through this framework and recognizing the distinctive help we get in each one of the four scenes. First, let me summarize the scenes for you. I've found this graphic to be a really helpful summary for each. The four scenes, of course, are creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And this graphic is a way of summarizing them to show you even some of the ideas or resonances that stretch across. For now, just to notice creation and restoration have an echo of each other. And there is contrast between, let's say, the clouds on creation and the clouds that have now turned stormy under the fall, or the crown under redemption and the crown, again, under restoration. Each one of these four scenes refers to, of course, a major portion of the biblical information or the biblical story. Creation first, God made the world, he made it good. The fall, sin corrupts the world. And so we see all of the shattering, the mess, the destruction that comes about because of Adam's sin. Jesus Christ enters into our sorrow with redemption. And finally, at the end of time, we can expect, we know, that all things will ultimately be restored. So let's go through each one of these and just understand the structure or the emphasis of each one of these major scenes, starting with creation. And what we'll say to summarize this is that God saw what he had made, and behold, it was very good. God saw what he had made, and behold, it was very good. This concept of goodness, or the idea that the creation as God made it was a good thing, not an evil thing, this is really fundamental to understanding the biblical story. And you, you see this in various parts of scripture, but particularly right at the beginning. It's the constant emphasis in Genesis that as God makes the world, and as he makes every individual portion of the world, the animals, the, the skies, every aspect of creation that he made, it was all very good. Scripture emphasizes that each time. So if we just go through the narrative itself in Genesis 1 and 2, we get language like this. God saw the light that it was good. The gathering of the seas. God called the seas. He saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. In fact, it's so often across the narrative that it's almost overwhelming. Until you come down to a summary of the entire section, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. So a fundamental assertion or belief of Christianity 
is that the world was created good, not evil. When God made it, it was good. There's another related concept that you have to know, and this is the concept of the image of God. So again, you find this right in the beginning, in the foundational text of Christianity or the foundational text of, of understanding creation, we see this kind of pattern. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the, the earth, over everything that creepeth upon the earth. So God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. The pattern of these ideas is that God made mankind unique for a specific purpose. Mankind is not parallel or equal to the animals or any other aspect of creation. He's different because he is made in God's image. And this is not the time and the place to build up an entire theology of the image of God in man, except just to say that it is a role given to man to have dominion or, said differently, to take care of the creation that God made. And this is unique to humanity. Humans are different than any other creature. Psalm 8 builds this idea out further. Again, you can see creation language. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? And the question, of course, goes man because he is so small, he is so insignificant. So why does man matter or what's the big deal about mankind? Why would man stand out separate? You've made him a little lower than the angels. But see, it goes further. You've crowned him with glory and honor, and you gave him dominion over the work of your hands. You put all things under his feet, fish, oxen, beasts, fowl, fish of the air, whatever passes through the paths of the sea, all of it under the dominion of mankind. So if I was going to summarize then the initial concept that we take out of this first stage creation, a question, the core concept that I mentioned earlier and that we'll return to with each one of these scenes. The, the question goes, is reality good or bad? And the answer is, God made it good. When God made it, all was good. Everything was as it ought to be. Well, this is important. This is critical for our thinking about reality on one level because of this. There is a tendency, a, a rather broken tendency, to talk about the physical world as somehow inferior or evil. And that gets into our heads enough that we almost start to think this is a Christian idea, as though one of the core commitments of Christianity is to try to be not physical, but spiritually focused. Don't think about the physical world. Don't think about physical things because that's kind of tainted or evil. Try to get into the physical sphere or the spiritual sphere and think about those kinds of things and you'll be better off. And to that, Christianity rightly understood answers absolutely not. God made the world. He made it both physical and spiritual, all of it. And all of it is good. Well, if that's true, then why does it seem like the world is bad? I asked here as part of the core concept, is reality good or bad? And I answered that it's fundamentally, or at least in the beginning, good when God made it. But what went wrong? Of course, the answer is the second phase or the second scene of the story. And this is that mankind chose to sin. Now we've moved to Genesis 3. And the story goes, as you know, that Satan enters and he tempts Eve. And he denies God's word. Has God really said? And he even impugns God's motives. Well, God knows that if you take of this fruit, you will be like God's. Almost that God would be jealous somehow. Eve considers and decides that the fruit is good to look at, and even she assumes it would be good to eat, and she takes it. She gives it to her husband, he takes it with her. And the result of this now is that there's a curse, a brokenness that extends to the entire creation. Earlier, I highlighted the word good, and that's stretching across the first part of the book of Genesis. Now we can notice the word curse stretching also across the first part of the book of Genesis. Genesis 3, thou art cursed above all cattle. Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground, and sorrow will come. Now you are cursed from the earth. And even down to Noah, there's the hope that people have. The ground which God has cursed, perhaps finally things will be set right. 
Of course, the concept of the curse starts off initially in chapter 3. And here we have the discussion between God and Adam, Adam, Adam and Eve. It's his curse to them. One of the highlighting phrases in here is that he says to man, you are dust and you will be returning to dust. Here, the conclusion of it, for dust you were taken out of the ground, dust you are, and to dust you will return. And that is then highlighting how broken everything is about the earth and about mankind as a result of sin. We find this just spreading out from there. So if we keep on moving in the narrative, we move to the next set of, of, of discussions or events where we find that now not just Adam and Eve, but even their descendants have been tainted and broken by sin. Cain and Abel are fighting, and the result of this is that Abel is killed by Cain. So we have the first murder. We go a little bit further and Cain is driven away from God. And now there's uh, great chaos, even down to the extent that in chapter four, we discover Lamech bragging about what he's done. I've slain a man to my wounding. If Cain will be avenged sevenfold, then I will be 70 and sevenfold. Lamech is saying all of this to his wives. In other words, you've discovered just already by chapter 4 that Adam and Eve sinned, but that sin extends to their descendants, and now marriage has been affected. Now brotherly or sibling relationships have been affected. Now we find murder, and we find polygamy. We find every aspect of human life corrupted by sin. If you keep on going through the book of Genesis, you discover humans learning more and understanding the complexity of the world. They're figuring out how to do things with technology. They're growing in a sense more intelligent or wiser. They're accumulating knowledge. But the more they accumulate, the worse it gets. And you find, aspect, you find events like the flood or the Tower of Babel. When God in a sense is judging, but he's also showing mercy by limiting humanity's sin from the extent to which it would destroy all. In all of this then, you're seeing just how nasty the curse is. If I was talking about my core concept here, again phrased as a question, what is wrong with the world? The world, in a real sense, it doesn't make sense. It's a mystery, it's a paradox. And the paradox of this is to say, I look around me in the world and, and so much of it is beautiful and good. I mean, think about all the joys and the, the wonderful things of life on planet Earth. Family, relationships, conversations, learning, exercise, and sleep, and food, and mountains, and I mean, all of the beauty, the ocean, sunsets. Life is beautiful. Except when it isn't. And... And therefore, we have to add into those things all, diseases, viruses, bacteria, sickness, toothaches, weariness. If we enjoy sleep, then there's also weariness and hunger and ultimately death. And, and the paradox of it goes, why would this world and life be so wonderful and so awful? Why would we have such joy and it also be so broken? But if I'm going to extend that down to humanity, it goes there too. Humans are wonderful. They're intelligent. They're clever. They're funny. We enjoy relationships with people around us. And we're grateful for then the richness and the beauty of the image of God in man. Except humans, as wonderful as they are, can also be really awful. Sometimes the same people that show kindness in one part of life are horrifyingly wicked and just nasty in another part of life. How can one creature be so good and so bad? How can humanity and how can life itself be so good and yet so bad? Do you remember when I talked about the curse a little bit ago? And I talked about God's words to Adam and Eve, just that he's cursing them or condemning them because of their sin. I express something like there is both mercy and judgment at the same time. They seem to run together. And one of the expressions of that appears as God is addressing the serpent, but with Adam and Eve certainly in the background and listening. He says, I will put enmity between the thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Which at this point is kind of a, a bit of a mysterious comment. 
all you really get out of it is that the woman will have a descendant and that that descendant will be at war with the serpent and his descendants. So the woman and her descendants, the serpent and his descendants at war with each other and ultimately down to a point where there's a, a great, some kind of climactic battle and the head of the serpent is crushed and the, the seed of the woman is bruised or hurt, the serpent ultimately will perish. So what is that all about or what's happening with that? And that takes us to the next movement in the story. Now we move to redemption. The phrase I would use to summarize this, he will save his people from their sins. And we find multiple ideas that build this up together, starting with just the emphasis across Genesis and beyond on the seed, the concept of the offspring that we've just looked at a moment ago, all over Genesis. Here we see thy seed and her seed, and we see promises in Genesis 9 to your seed after you, and God appearing to Abraham and saying, to your seed I will give this land. I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so your seed also will be beyond number. And continuing on, the blessing to his seed. Your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Your seed will receive this land. Your seed will be multiplied Exceedingly, but ultimately, though, the seed will be a blessing, a blessing to all the earth. And that comes climactically in chapter 22. God's saying an everlasting covenant with Abraham and with his seed, and an everlasting covenant that leads to the blessing of all. In God's words, in blessing I will bless you, in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. As you proceed then through the biblical story, then this is a constant question. What, or maybe rather, who is this seed? And how would this be part of the fulfillment of the hope or the longings or the fear of humanity? And as you go through the rest of the Old Testament, you see promises like the seed promise to Abraham, we saw, the seed promise to David, David will have a descendant, and a promise even to the nation of Israel, that as a whole, then, there will be a child born, and that child will be the solution or the Messiah. You're not sure, as you read across the Old Testament, how this child could also solve the problems of humanity. The answer becomes more full. Psalm 8 describes to us, what is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you pay attention to him. And yet mankind is set over creation. And if I move from Psalm 8 into Hebrews 2, I get the fuller picture. I discover, in fact, that it's not, it is not just mankind who is the blessing, and mankind who is the king, but it is a single image of God, a single person, Jesus Christ, the image of God, who brings about hope for humanity. And that ties us into other themes, many other themes, too many to survey. I'll just highlight one. If we're talking about the fact that mankind was made to rule, to have dominion, to subdue the earth, then how would the seed, the Messiah, have dominion and rule over the earth? Well, you get a pattern with king and kingdom so that Matthew 27 will emphasize multiple times Jesus Christ as king of the Jews, the king of the Jews, the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. And yet this is a really fitting transition because while he is the king of Israel, it does not mean that he is beyond sorrow. In fact, you find this emphasis aligned or overlapping with his suffering. He's king because he suffers and dies. And if I put that in a framework of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, then we find that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, has come and carried our griefs, our sorrows, our iniquities, our transgressions, our peace. His stripes are our healing, the iniquity of us all laid upon him. Okay, these are patterns you know and that you're familiar with. But the concept of all of these is that instead of humanity suffering alone and dying alone, the Son of God leaves heaven to experience suffering. He carries our sin. What ought to have happened to me happens to him. And then he's victorious over that sin. He's victorious over death. He's victorious over it all. And he lives again and he reigns 
as king. And if I was going to summarize this with a core concept, I would say this as a question, how can we deal with guilt? How can wicked, sinful people approach a holy God? And the answer is, the suffering and sorrow of our sin has fallen instead on him so that we can be set free. The final stage in the story is restoration. We could summarize it with the phrase, behold, I make all things new. And the pattern with this goes that if you're watching carefully, at the beginning of Genesis, we read the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. But if we read to the end of the story, we discover a very parallel pattern. And it is that I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Or Isaiah will say it with this language that God says, I behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 65 giving us exactly this kind of concept. I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered. I will make it all new. How would all creation be made new? Isaiah 11, it's the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots. The one who will rule in righteousness. And so we see language like the wolf lying down with the lamb, the leopard lying down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, the cow and the bear grazing, the long, young ones lying down together and the lion eating straw like an ox. What's going on here? The idea of it is that when Jesus reigns as king, the creation itself will be made right. All things will be transformed. The people, the humans, the world itself. And if I go backwards in that framework, thinking through some of the concepts we've highlighted here, in terms of this graphic, recognize that the restoration or the end of all things is kind of an echo of the beginning. The creation was made good. At the end, it's kind of restored back to that again. It's, you could initially think of it almost like a circle coming around, and finally we've returned around to where we were. Except not just that we returned to where we were. It's not just a circle, but it's linear. It's also a progression, and you can see that the two images are similar, but they're different. Now, finally, the world is made right because it is under the rule of the righteous king who reigns over all things. Do you remember our idea at creation? Mankind was made in the image of God. He was made to rule and to reign. We saw that mankind's ruling and reign actually, reigning actually turns nasty because mankind starts using his powers for evil instead of good. We saw that that means Jesus Christ steps forward and he becomes the true king, the true fulfillment of Psalm 8 to do everything mankind ought to have done. The end of it all is that the world is right because Jesus Christ reigns over it as king. And if I was going to then come to a summary statement for this final movement in the story, we could ask a question, is there a point to our existence? What are we doing and, and why? And the answer is yes, absolutely. The end of the story returns to the goodness of the beginning, except even richer and more full. So let me summarize these, each one of these movements and just to recognize the core concept that we've drawn from them all. We can summarize all of these major concepts or these major stages and then the core concept for each, the idea that I want you to know for each one of these stages. Now, once you get this summary or once you get this framework for thinking about the entire history of the world and the entire history of scripture this becomes really powerful not just for biblical theology and knowing the framework itself but for examining different topical studies as a way forward and a way of analyzing questions or problems or being able to trace your way through all of scripture so my intention here is to take this structure, the structure of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And I want to talk with you about two specific topics. I'll talk about the problem of evil and then a practical question, family, or how to develop a theology of the family. Let's start with evil. And just four points that really help us think differently about evil and how to help people or counsel people as they're struggling through this question. 
The first is this, the uniqueness of the biblical worldview. Evil is not just a given. It's not just kind of the way things are. And in many frameworks, secular materialism, Buddhism, many other worldviews, evil is just reality. Can't do anything about it. Might as well adjust yourself to it. In the biblical story, evil is not normal. Evil is the aberration. Evil is the strange thing. God did not originally make the world evil. He made it good. And so when you encounter evil in the world and something about that bothers you and makes you feel like like something's wrong or broken, the answer from scripture is you're right. It's not supposed to be this way. This is not normal. That moves to the second stage, fall. And in terms of suffering, sorrow, and death, the biblical answer is that the world is broken like this and we have death and we have suffering and sorrow because of sin. So as you and I then deal with the problem of suffering and the problem of evil, it's very helpful to recognize that it is this way because of the wrong choice that all of us have made, not just individually, as though a person who suffers automatically is a more wicked person, but it's the reminder that in reality and in life, all about us, there's this constant clear indication This is why we're suffering. This is why we have a problem. We have a need for a solution to sin. And I think in that respect, the problem of evil is is significantly helped by a Christian worldview. If we encounter horrifying situations, let's say an evil dictator, Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler, Christianity is not just going to look at that and say, well, That's the way it is, can't do anything about those people. But Christianity tells you that there is judgment coming. It will be set right. Wicked people will be dealt with. No, it will not continue like this forever. There is justice. The problem, of course, if there's justice for them, there will also be justice for me. So how do we process the problem of sin in respect to ourselves? And that takes us to the third movement. For the problem of evil, recognizing its deep connection to the cross then brings us hope. We're suffering, sorrow, sin, death. They're all linked. They're all connected. Jesus' death on the cross is the event of God taking upon himself. The the suffering and the sin and the sorrow that ought to be ours. Remember the concept of the curse in the second movement of the story under fall. In the movement, this movement, redemption, we discover that he goes beyond and he becomes the center of the curse. The curse falls on him. And therefore, all of what ought to be mine in the curse instead is his. The final movement of the story gives us a rich hope because there is the confidence not just that the world is evil and broken and that's that, what can be done about it, but that there is hope. There is a grand conclusion. The world will be restored and set right. And what could be a richer answer to the problem of evil or the struggle with sorrow and suffering and pain, but to say that eventually God will not just leave us in this situation. We will not even, as in Buddhism, just be removed from it so that we're conscious of nothing, but it will actually be made positively good again. The world is not supposed to be broken like this, and it will be right. It will be beautiful. Or to move to my final example, let's talk about the family. And can we really take the family and run it through this grid? Well, in fact, we can. If you want to challenge yourself, you could pause the lecture for a second and you could think through creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. How would I process family or the topic of family and those relationships through each one of those four stages? If you do, what you're going to end up with is starting with creation. The fact that God made humanity in the beginning in communion or in family relationships. So things like marriage, Adam and Eve, this is not a cultural construct. This is the way God made it and it's good. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. God gave them the blessing so that they together would live out the blessing. 
God saw everything that he had made. It was very good. God actually created the man and the woman. And he said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help fitting for him. So God brought the two together. And the result of this is that a man would leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife. They shall be one flesh. Okay, so the point of all of this is that male, female, marriage, family, relationship, and even specifically, a little hint of the sexual relationship at the end, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. All of this is creational. God made it. It is right and it is good. And it is not just a cultural construct. The genders are mutually dependent. The genders have to work together. There is also here the indication of headship and a creational kind of concept with headship that again is good. So we set as our foundation that our thinking about marriage, male and female, gender identity, and even relationships are creational and therefore good because God made it. Move to the second phase. The second seed of the story is the fall. And in that framework or within the fall, we recognize that the immediate distortions are already starting to affect all every part of reality, including, yes, marriage. Okay, some of what's going on here in the temptation in the fall is even a, a contravening or a breaking of the marriage relationship. Satan approached Eve, not Adam. He broke the family order somehow. And the first sin involved distortions in family order and family relationships. The result of the curse, if you read carefully God's curse and how it's addressed, is that now the man and his wife are going to have trouble with each other, and their marriage is going to be a struggle. There will be trouble not just between them, but even now for reproduction, children being born, it will be in pain that children will enter the world. Immediately after chapter 4, you discover that marriage and family has been broken by the curse when you see the first murder, and it's in a sibling relationship, a brother killing a brother. This is never the way it was supposed to be. And Lamech speaking to his wives. It was never supposed to be like that. So that sin how has perverted and distorted family. Move forward into the Old Testament as we proceed through Genesis and beyond. And we discover that polygamy is constant. Not as much as sometimes we might think, but Abraham, David, and, and yet the biblical pattern for that within this whole framework is that just because they did it doesn't mean it's good. In fact, what you're seeing is that even some of the best of humanity are still broken in their thinking. And this is not commended. They are breaking marriage. They're breaking the way that God intended it to be. And there's an, an extraordinary pattern all the way across the Old Testament of failure and breakdown in this way. Even language where we discover that wrapped up with people's worship is adultery. They're worshiping false gods, and that is called spiritual adultery. And yes, it's also wrapped up with immorality and illicit acts. Move to the New Testament. And as we come there, we discover now in this next section or the next scene, redemption, that Jesus is the ultimate paradigm for family, family relationships. Jesus taking flesh is actually born into a family. And what that means then is that he willingly submitted himself to father and mother. Jesus Christ, Luke 2.52, increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And within then a relationship, submitting himself to fallen humans, he shows us what it looks like as the perfect son of God to fulfill everything that a son, a child ought to be. But he also richly calls people to restored obedience to honor father and mother. He teaches them the true meaning of what it is to not commit adultery. And at the very same time, he also calls people to transcend those relationships. People ought to be willing to leave father and mother, if necessary, to follow Jesus. People must not commit adultery, but he also affirms that there are people who choose not to be married for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And he also reminds people that there is value and dignity in the family and in marriage, but it is not absolute. It is not the entire or ultimate reality, so that there is something higher himself. 
And Jesus calls then people to fulfill the intentions of family without that being the end all. If you move into the epistles, you discover that many of the New Testament commands are given around the framework of us as family. We are brothers and sisters. Even Ephesians 5 takes the concept of marriage that the man and his wife and their relationship is, is bigger and richer, more significant than just them. It's not just their marriage that's at stake, but it's pointing to something bigger and it's pointing to the relationship between Christ and the church. And therefore, a right way to read the epistles and the, the family commands about marriage and about children and about fathers is not just that it's telling you how to have a successful family or how to be a happy family, but instead that what we're reading in the epistles is saying something or it's a picture telling people something about God and the gospel. That the family is the laboratory where we learn the various relationships and the exercise of the fruit of the Spirit that we have to have in order to function together correctly, in order to show what right relationships would mean for the glory of God. The family and even the challenges within it turns into a kind of a sanctification laboratory. That takes me to the final stage, and this is eternity. And a basic question that people sometimes ask here is something like, well, will I see my wife in heaven? Will I be together with my family in heaven? There are some very slight indications that, yes, we'll see individuals, people that we love in heaven. We also, though, see language like they are neither married nor given in marriage, but they are like the angels, Jesus says. You know, let's put this together. We recognize that we do have physical bodies. We will be able to recognize other people in eternity. And there is a, a slight element of this as part of our hope that we do not need to sorrow as others who have no hope, but that we rejoice and we take confidence that we will see people again in the future. But there are two really stri striking patterns in the information here. And one of them in respect to eternity is the concept that we now see in a glass darkly. I think the idea here goes, we wouldn't understand eternity or the new heavens and the new earth if God explained it to us. It would be too far beyond our comprehension. A second repeated recurring concept across the New Testament in respect to eternity is that the center of our focus in eternity is not the people or the gold or the pearls or the surroundings, but it's the Lord. The center of our worship and our joy is always going to be Him. He's the center of our eternity. And I think then the way we're supposed to think about family in relationship to eternity is that yes, we can be grateful that we'll see people in eternity and people that we loved. But what if the concept works like this? We loved these people and knew these people because we spent time with them for some decades, maybe three or four decades. And those relationships were special to us because of all that time, decades of time spent together. But do you realize what it means to be in eternity forever? And, and I think the concept then goes, the joy of family, that's nice, that's good. But actually, the picture is much bigger and richer. I loved those people because I had a few decades with them on earth. What would it be like to be together with the entire family of the redeemed and all of us together forever without sin, selfishness, jealousy, or any of the other things that make relationships complicated? What if the picture then is that our family for all eternity is not just the few people around us that we were able to know on earth, but it is all of the redeemed. And ultimately, it is the clearest and most beautiful relationship with God himself. Now, my attempt in all of this, in going through this information extremely quickly, is just to try to illustrate to us that we can take multiple different concepts, the problem of evil or the question of the family, but many others. And you can run these concepts through the grid of the four stages of the biblical story, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Take any one of a number of topics and you'll discover that scripture itself contains the progression, the beauty of this story, 
is run out or understood completely by our understanding that all of the story fits through this lens and we see the development across these four stages. A concluding encouragement as far as how we read scripture. It's tempting sometimes to take individual passages or individual narratives and just make a direct line across. Here's the passage, here's the event, here's the character in the story. And then we want to draw across and say, okay, here's the application. So as we said earlier, I see Daniel, I see his extraordinary faith, and I want to draw some kind of practical conclusion. Okay, be like Daniel. And I want to encourage us instead with each one of these issues to recognize that the connection runs across the storyline of scripture and through these four frames. So that as you're exploring, let's say again, the instance of Daniel, you're supposed to recognize that he's in a very difficult situation. In Babylon, the nation has been destroyed. All of this mess that's come about because of sin. And you're kind of struggling through at that point. What is God doing? Does he have a plan? You've got to remember, though, that from the beginning, God's intentions for the world were good. And that's going to point you towards the Messiah. Because as we saw last time, as Daniel is dealing with the sorrow and the difficulty and the complexity of life on planet Earth due to sin, there's a hope coming. That hope is future-oriented. And Daniel's ultimate hope is that the brokenness of this entire world will be set right at the end of all things by the reign of Jesus Christ, the King, when all things are restored. As you and I then understand scripture through these four lenses, we understand a much richer and much more beautiful, a complete understanding. And that also then brings us into counseling or practical applications. And we can recognize that as you and I deal with the different challenges that we face personally or the people around us, each one of these phases gives us a window into reality and helps us encourage people. And so that as someone, let's say, is frustrated by the injustice of the world, we can remind them that God did not intend it to be this way. This is a temporary distortion, a result of sin and brokenness, but that Jesus entered into our suffering. He experienced what it was like, and he understands the sorrow, sorrow and suffering that you have right now. But don't lose heart, because Jesus will return, and he will make all things new. And you and I then stand in the middle of the progress of this story. In so many ways, we partake of all four elements of it. We are a restored, redeemed creation, kind of a future new creation, but we still live in the middle of all of the mess right now. And we do so on the basis or the confidence that Jesus died for us, that he rose again, and that he will return to restore all things again. So in the present, then, we struggle and we wait, but we have hope. He's coming. Things will be right and good. I trust that by thinking through Scripture, through the lens of these four stages or these four scenes, you and I can transform our reading, transform our, understa transform our understanding of the world, and live in a way that brings honor and glory to our God because of understanding the truth about what he has done and what he will do.